We'll go ahead now with uh, what is basically the final session is combined uh, discussion on two aspects of uh, relapse refractory disease. And so uh, Vincent Rajkumar and Tom Morton will cover this uh, uh, topic, one focusing on uh, combinations with approved drugs and the, the other focusing more on uh, the, the future directions with uh, agents still in clinical trials. So first of all, I'll welcome uh, Tom, who's circling behind me here. Please welcome Tom Martin. Hello. Uh. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce the case, and then, and then uh, Vincent and I are going to talk about, he's going to talk about early relapse, and I'll talk about yeah. uh, when all else fails. Yeah. So in this case, it's a 72-year-old male, otherwise healthy, who presented with back pain and fatigue. He had uh, compression fractures of L4 and L5. In terms of labs, he had a mild anemia, elevated total protein, an M protein of 4.2 grams, a kappa light chain of 1,200 milligrams per liter, um, and an elevated LDH. He had um, PET imaging that showed multiple hypermetabolic lesions, and then a bone marrow biopsy showing 75% kappa-restricted plasma cells in fish with 1Q gain um, in 414 translocation. Uh, so he was treated with RVD for six cycles and achieved a VGPR. And like we found out in our last discussion, he went to transplant. Uh, and his three-month response was a stringent CR. Uh, so he was immunofix uh, and SPEP negative with normal light chains and IHC negative on his bone marrow. But he did have an R uh, MRD test, and his MRD was positive. So he received continuous RVD maintenance vis-a-vis -vis the Emory approach for 21 months until follow-up showed increasing light chains. He didn't have an M protein, he just had light chains. His kappa light chain was now 150 milligrams per liter, so it went from normal to 150, uh, with a lambda of 5 milligrams per liter and a ratio of 30. But he remained asymptomatic. So let's vote. Okay, so in your current practice, which of the following treatment options would you choose? Observe, he's asymptomatic, you can follow the pace of disease. Two, um, switch to daratumab lenalidomide dex, DRD, daratumab palm dex, DPD, daratumab bortezomib dex, DVD, daratumab carfilzomib dex, DKD, or carfilzomib dex, KD, or carfilzomib pomalidomide dex, KPD, and finally, exazomib lenalidomide dex, or are you unsure? Let's vote. A lot of options. And survey says, okay, a wide, a wide uh, display with the majority of people saying to observe them, and you can follow the pace of his disease, and then a backup to that to do daratumab pomalidomide index, and then a few for daratumab lenalidomide dex, uh, and a bunch of other daratumabs, including a daratumab carfilzomib dex. So the majority of people actually chose a daratumab-based regimen. All right, let's see what advisors showed. Okay, so across the board, most of, most of us chose daratumab pomalidomide index. Most of us would switch because they have high-risk disease and had progression on therapy. Uh, and then Dr. Dury um, and Dr. San Miguel also thought carfilzomib, uh, daratumab, and dexamethasone would be a reasonable option. Okay, continued. So the patient was treated with daratumab pomalidomide index, and after two cycles, he achieves a VGPR immunofixation positive. He continued DPD with reduction in pomalidomide and dexamethasone due to side effects. And then at nine months, he experienced increased light, uh, light chain values. His kappa was now 50 milligrams per liter. His lambda was 2.5, ratio of 20, and he developed symptomatic femur pain. An MRI shows a large bone lesion with a soft tissue component. The pet showed no other lesions. So let's vote on this one. What to do? In your current practice, which of the following would you choose next? Radiation to the femur, you know, focal rogue area, and then continue DPD. Switch to carfilzomib palm dex, KPD. Switch to daratumab carfilzomib dex. Switch to elotuzumab pomalidomide dex. Or go to cell and or dexamethasone. Or how about a clinical trial with a BCMA-targeted agent? 
Are you unsure? Again, a lot of options. <laughs> okay, again, we got quite varied, but um, many of you, a third of you, would, would uh, send them to a clinical trial targeting a BCMA. Um, antigen on the cell surface. I, I like that. We'll talk about that right after uh, Dr. Raj Kumar. And then about a, a fifth of the people had said, just do radiation and continue uh, DPD. And then the next one was Dertumab, Carfilzomib, and Dexamethasone. Okay, so what did the experts say? So a, a bunch of people said clinical trial targeting BCMA. We have um, Carfilzomib, Pomalidomide, Dexamethasone uh, for a couple. Um, and so there is no one answer for, for these questions, which makes myeloma actually quite interesting. All right, continued. The patient was treated with KPD. He achieved stable disease with stable serum-free light chain values for four cycles. Then a repeat PET so shows two new lesions with no change in the light chains. Let's vote again. We're going quick. Okay. Now, how about now? Cell and X are in DEX. Next, bendamustine in DEX. Next, treat him with chemotherapy, hyper CVAT or DPACE. He very, um, has very aggressive disease. And then a clinical trial targeting BCMA, or a clinical trial targeting a novel alkylating agent like melflufen, or a clinical trial tar targeting a new cerebron, E3 ligase, like a cell, a cell mod like ibertamide, or other or unsure. Yeah. All right, so the majority of people said, let's go to BCMA. Okay, very good. That's excellent. And, uh, and what did the experts say? Pretty much everybody said uh, targeting BCMA, except for me, I said all the above. <laughs> and we'll talk, we'll talk about that. Okay, with that, I'm going to invite Dr. Raj Kumar to come up and talk about the landscape um, and relapse refractory myeloma, which combinations to use and when. Thanks. Well, I wish I was paying attention to these questions when they came to me to answer. So it looks like I answered them completely wrong. Uh, the first patient, I think I said um, uh, Dara, Dara Palmdex or something. Anyway, anyway, please don't do as I say, don't not as I do or whatever. <laughs> um, the main thing with relapse is that if you if you heard the arguments about should we use Dara RD or KRD or or Dara BRD or Dara KRD and so on, all those complications and choices are nothing compared to the choices we face in relapse because there's so many more regimens and so many more factors you have to take into account when you want to pick a regimen. It's not just as simple as picking the best myeloma regimen as you would do in the newly diagnosed setting. So here is a small acronym that I use. It's TRAP, T-R-A-P, which is we need to consider the timing of the relapse. When is the relapse occurring? Is it one year after stopping therapy? Is it while the patient's on therapy? Is it several years the patient's been off therapy and now they are relapsing? And that's very critical in terms of what regimen you're going to choose. How did they respond to the previous treatments? So for example, if they had VRD for one year, did really well and then went off therapy for four years and now they are relapsing, you might just go back to the VRD again. So response to the prior therapy in terms of how did they respond, how did they tolerate it is, is the second factor you have to consider. How aggressive is the relapse? Is the relapse just a simple monoclonal protein rising? Or is the patient relapsing with circulating plasma cells and extramedullary plasma cytomas or lytic lesions? And then what is the performance status of the patient? How much can they handle? Can they handle another transplant? Can they handle a quadruplet regimen or BDT pace? Everything has to be considered when you pick the regimen. So first, I'll just go through the data that are out there for the randomized controlled trials for relapsed disease. 
There were four drugs that were approved using a DARA, or using a Lendex backbone. So Lendex versus Lendex plus one of these drugs. Carfilzomib, Ixazomib, Daratumumab, Elotuzumab. And I won't go through the data in detail, but it's pretty straightforward that all of these drugs are active. And if you compare them as a triplet versus Lendex alone, we found benefit. So Carfilzomib Lendex was significantly better than Lendex in the Aspire trial. Ixazomib Lendex was better than Lendex in the Tourmaline trial. Elotuzumab Lendex was better than Lendex in the Eloquin trial, and Daratumumab Lendex was better than Lendex in the Pollux trial. All these resulted in these four drugs getting approved because they showed beyond reasonable doubt that the drug is active, is active in relapse disease. There were a couple of studies done with the Bortezomib Dex backbone. Daratumumab did two trials, so they had one with Dara Bortezomib Dex versus Bortezomib Dex, as, and then Panabinostat. Same story here, the triplet was associated with better progression-free survival, panobinostat, botezomib dex versus botezomib dex, and then dara botezomib dex versus botezomib dex. These also resulted in these drugs getting approved and these regimens getting approved. What we know is that these are active drugs. It's actually a great strategy to get a drug approved because you're showing the, the control group is not placebo. The control group is getting therapy, and then you're showing that the new drug is adding value. The problem with these six trials right now for me is that these are six good regimens, but they have not been compared head to head. So we have all these trials of two versus three, but not a single trial of three versus three to tell me which of these would be the best treatment for first relapse. And in the absence of such a trial, we have to really not compare across trials, but look at the hazard ratios and see if we can make some sense. And this is from a paper that Bob and I did it uh, years ago. And you can see that daratumumab-based regimens in general had almost like a 65 to 70 percent, uh, sorry, 60 to, 7, 60 to 65 percent reduction in the risk of progression. Uh, whereas the other regimens had more like a 25 to 30 percent reduction in the risk of progression. So to me, any of these triplets is great, and you'll have to choose them based on affordability and the trap factors that I mentioned. But if I had to choose and all factors were equal, then a darrow based regimen probably is my preference. And that is why the algorithm here is if the patient is not refractory to lenalidomide, a DARA Lendex is reasonable. If the patient is refractory to lenalidomide, DARA Botezomib Dex or DARA Palm Dex, all these three regimens are approved in the US for uh, patients with relapse disease. But you could choose any of these other regimens as well, and that you would not be wrong. I don't think a patient is going to live longer because you chose one ahead of the other. I think as long as you are giving the patient the opportunity to take each one of these in some rational manner in a successive, you know, as they relapse each time, they should live just about the same length of time, and the only factors that will be our performance status, can they tolerate the regimens, uh, and affordability. The problem also is that these six trials were mainly done with patients enrolled in Europe and other countries, not in the US, and in the US, Right now, for first relapse, we are encountering only patients who have already had lenalidomide, whereas these trials enroll patients who had not, by and large, seen lenalidomide. So we have to have a second generation of trials which looked at what are the outcomes in relapse disease for patients or what are the regimens we can use for patients who are already exposed to lenalidomide for three, four years, for example. And here we have a, at least five trials that have come. Most of them are randomized trials, not all. And we have some really good data here on palmalidomide dexamethasone-based regimens. And you can see here elopalmdex versus palmdex, significant improvement in progression-free survival. This was a surprising trial for me because the benefit of elo with palmdex was much more than what it had with lendex. Isatuximab palmdex versus palmdex, this study has been published in The Lancet. Uh, this is a monoclonal antibody against CD38, just like daratumumab. It's not yet approved. Hopefully, it will get approved and compete with dara on price, maybe. Um, 
but it seems to be as effective or equally effective in phase twos. And in this phase three trial, it was um, superior to PalmDex. Palmolinamide bortezomib dex versus bortezomib dex is another uh, triplet that's been studied in Lenex post patients in the optimism trial and was found to be beneficial. You had a couple of phase twos. One is daratumumab palm dex, a, a regimen we use commonly in the US, and carfilzomib palm dex, which we also use commonly in the US. How do we put this together? The problem is that these regimens are going to just keep increasing. You're going to have you know, 20, 30 regimens that you could choose for second relapse, because if, if first relapse choice was a problem, second relapse is even more of a problem. Um, th therefore, I think it's more important to just go into principles. And the principles are that you want to choose at least, if a patient's relapsing, you want to choose a triplet or better, maybe even a quadruplet. You want to have at least two new drugs compared to the regimen that they are previously relapsing on. So if it's VRD, you should go to Dara Palmdex. I should have gone to Dara Palmdex. I don't know why I put Dara Bortezomib Dex. I think that is a typo. <laughs> I, I take the fifth. Um, so you need at least two new drugs. And then you need to consider transplant in all the eligible patients for two reasons. As I told you, whether we like it or not, some patients do not want early transplant and they are storing stem cells for future. But we cannot forget that they have stored stem cells for future. So when they relapse, we have to ask, always consider is the patient transplant eligible? Do they have stem cells in reserve? Have they opted previously for a delayed transplant and should I do that transplant now? Or if they had a really good response with the first transplant, maybe you do the transplant again the second time when they relapse. And then better still clinical trials. A lot of these progress that we've seen would not have happened unless we've had these clinical trials. And there are a plethora of clinical trials for relapse disease in almost any country. So what are the algorithms for second or higher relapse? Really, it's very hard to tell other than to say any of the first relapse options that the patients previously not tried would be reasonable, provided you follow the principles of using at least two new drugs. And then there are several additional options that you can use for each subsequent relapse. You may have to go back to the old regimens like VDT pace or anthracycline containing regimens. Not forget melphalan and alkylators. For example, Cybor-D or a melphalan-based regimen or melphalan itself given IV can give you a response in a number of patients. Selinexor has just been approved in the US and there is an abstract here with Selinexor Palmdex which seems to be quite active in relapse refractory disease. Bendamustine-based regimens, adding panobinostat to a PI or proteasome inhibitor, adding panobinostat might get you an extra response, or starting to um, you know, consider quadruplet or even five drug regimens to control the disease as much as possible. And if we have all these drugs, we are going to have even more in the future. As you know, CAR-T's therapy is highly effective in myeloma, and hopefully we will have some approved soon. Belantumab, the anti-BCMA antibody from GSK, is active, and that, those results so far are very promising in phase two. Hopefully that drug can get approved. The Amgen compounds, 420701, you, you should be hearing about that very soon, the bites. Isatuximab, ibertamide, venetoclax, melflufen, the list goes on. There are going to be a number of options. As these drugs come up, I think we will have better ways of controlling the disease, making myeloma more into a chronic disease, but we have to somehow follow certain principles to make sure we choose these drugs in rational uh, sequence. So I will close here and to discuss all these options that I showed on that side, which I didn't go into in detail, I'm inviting Dr. Tom Martin, who will come and give you the scoop on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vincent. So I am going to describe uh, the landscape in truly refractory myeloma, what we use when all else fails, and also talk a little bit about the drugs that I think are going to be available in the not-so-distant future. So now, we talked about this case, and there were, I think, some important parts about this case that we see commonly in our, our clinic. This is an older patient 
who's had three prior lines of therapy. He's had RVD and was refractory to RVD, double refractory. He had DPD um, for nine months and then became refractory to, uh, to Dara Palm and then had KPD and became refractory to KPD. He is actually a pentarefractory patient. This, is, this patient has high-risk disease. This happens in our, in our clinics all the time. And I would say that this patient has triple-class refractory disease. Rather than saying every agent is triple-class refractory disease, I think at the current time, that really is the unmet medical need for us. We need more drugs for this population. It also, this case shows the point that he had an M-protein at start, but over time the M-protein went away and had what was called light chain escape. We always have to follow the light chains because it's often the light chain is going to be the measure of their disease activity. And then at the end, his light chains didn't even go up. And so some people actually become very oligosecretary. That is a tough, tough patient because often they don't uh, qualify for a clinical trial. So I put this... Uh, I put this panel together. On the, on the left or in blue are what we have available for us for such a patient when all else fails. And in the purple on the right are the things that essentially, and this is not meant to be inclusive, the same, things that are essentially going to be talked about at this ASH 2019. This is unbelievable. In the last day, I went to a number of meetings where, where we talked about the truly triple class refractory patient. Uh, I like the light activity, yes. Um, <laughs> And you know, we all came up with our favorite thing to do in the triple class refractory. Ah, we'll give them uh, cytoxin, a little cytoxin, a little velcade, a little do doxorubicin or liposomal doxorubicin. We can go over a lot of these things that we can make up, but they often don't work all that long, really. And the hope is that we get them onto a clinical trial. Now, in the purple, there are, I think, a number of drugs that, in fact, may soon be, be available for us. Isatuximab, um, venetoclax, melflufen, um, Belantamab, uh, Mephidotin, um, Idacel, or BB2121, and then, and then Cartitude, the car with attitude. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the data. Okay, the first thing I want to go over, and, and I'm actually going to take pretty much a 10,000 foot view, because uh, we've all been here <laughs> a long time. Um, and let's look at Iber, uh, a next generation IMID, or a new, known as a cell mods. Um, and Iber um, is a next generation uh, from palmalidomide, and you can see here preclinically it has potent activity to degrade um, Icarus and Aielos, more potent than palm and linalidomide, so probably more potent cellular cytotoxicity. And then in terms of IL-2 secretion, it increases or enhances IL secretion by, uh, uh, by immune cells, suggesting that it is a better immunostimulant. So potentially a much a better drug than even POM and linalidomide. And with that, it was taken to a phase one trial, and Dr. Loneal presented it initially at ASCO and updated it at IMW. This phase one trial is in relapse refractory myeloma. They, patients had to have prior LEN, POM, and a protease, in, a protease inhibitor, and refractory to the latest line of therapy. And in fact, the study has multiple cohorts, but I'm only going to show you the responses for cohort B. It's Iber plus dexamethasone. And here are the data that, that Sagar presented. And the overall response rate in this refractory population was actually quite good, 32%. And if we look at the IMID refractory, it was still 35%, and DARA and POM refractory, again, still 30%. So a very potent agent together with dexamethasone. And what Sagar pointed out, it actually was, seemed to be very well tolerated. If we looked at TEAEs, grade three or four in cycle one, you know, no fatigue, no new neuropathy, no diarrhea. There was some infection and some blood count suppression. And we'll have to see how that does over time and how the toxicity changes over time. But a very potent agent that we're all looking forward to, what, to combine, to make it at a triplet, like that's gonna be done in the phase one trial, like I showed you. Now, there was a nice question about venetoclax, and I'm gonna briefly talk about venetoclax, and that, you know, this is a highly selective potent inhibitor of BCL2. Um, and in a phase one trial, Dr. Kumar showed that in the patients that have the 1114 translocation, the response rate is actually quite good. At single agent, 40% response rate. In the non 1114, it was only 6%. But we know that venetoclax actually could probably synergize with dexamethasone and also with the proteasome inhibitor due to their effects on MCL1 and also on uh, BCLXL. 
And so it's probably a potent combination. And Dr. Moreau has done the phase one trial combining the triplet, uh, venetoclax together with velcade and dexamethasone, and showed in a one to three um, prior therapy population that was sensitive to uh, velcade, an overall response rate that was greater than 95%, a very active combination. But a checkered pass with that, right? Because it, the Bellini trial happened. And I think everybody knows about the Bellini trial. And the Bellini trial, in the, in the all comers, there was an increased risk of death in those getting the triplet versus the doublet, abortezomib and dexamethasone. There was a lot of infectious uh, complications and some cardiovascular complications. Now, the response rate was actually better in the triplet, but, the, but it was a um, decreased survival. And so that was stopped, obviously, by the FDA. Now, the hidden pearl in this is the patients who had the 11-14 translocation or those that had the BCL2 high expression. And I show on the top left, in the 11-14s, the overall response rate was 90% versus 47%. And in the BCL2 high, 88% versus 73% uh, overall response rate. If we look at PFS, in fact, a dramatic difference in PFS, where the PFS with, with venetoclax plus dexamethasone was 9.5 uh, months and not reached in the triplet arm. And if you look at this hazard ratio, when have you seen a hazard ratio like that in oncology? I don't think we've seen many that are 0.1. I think this drug has significant activity in this population. There are a number of presentations at ASH. Here's one of them. It's an oral presentation, but there are all, also a number of um, poster presentations. Go by the posters, talk to the people about biomarker-driven activity in this, in this disease. Um, and so venetoclax is going to you know, be a, a useful drug for us um, in relapse refractory. But like Dr. Moreau said earlier, it's got to be then taken to frontline with a randomized trial. Now, Selenexer was FDA approved in July of 2019 um, in relapse refractory myeloma after four prior lines of therapy and refractory to two PIs, two IMIDs, and an anti-CD38 monoclonal antibody. Now, who marked that down on their chart? <laughs> you never see that, right? It's very hard to tell that. But in that, that is the indication, which is kind of interesting. And that was made like that due to the STORM trial, where 122 patients were given Selenexer and DEX, 80 milligrams twice weekly, with 20 milligrams of DEX, and it showed um, an overall response rate of 26.2%. I think the benchmark really being over 20% in a PFS of just under four months. And now there's many combinations with Selenexer and DEX. With proteasome inhibitors, with DARE2 and MAB, et cetera, there's many ongoing trials, including a, a, a phase three Boston trial of Selenexer, DEX versus Bortezomib, Selenexer, and DEX. Now it doesn't come without toxicity, right? Selenexer has some toxicity. Um, and it has some GI toxicity, has some fatigue, has some hyponatremia, and some blood count suppression. You can't just send them out and say, come back in four weeks and we'll start your next cycle. These people need to be seen weekly, and you have to follow them very closely. Now, another novel uh, agent is melflufen, and it's a lipophilic peptide conjugated alkylating agent. All right, say that five times fast. But the, the lipophilic component actually allows rapid entry into cells, um, cancer cells have uh, highly, um, are overexpressed aminopeptidases. They cleave the peptide. The cleaved alkylator stays intracellular, then goes into, into the nucleus and causes traditional alkylator toxicity. Now, there's been a couple studies with melflufen, or a number of studies with melflufen. The initial Paul uh, Richardson described at ASH a couple years ago uh, in the relapse refractory setting in double refractory uh, patients looking at melflufen. This was 20 or 40 milligrams IVQ four weeks. The dosing now is 40 milligram IVQ four weeks together with dexamethasone weekly um, and showed an overall response rate of 31%. It was taken to a much li larger trial, the Horizon trial, which Paul updated um, at EHA and also at the IMW meeting in September, showing in these very refractory patients, 50% um, were alkylator fractor refractory, 80% with DARE refractory, 62% had high-risk cytogenetics. This is a very refractory population. A lot of them had EMD, extramedullary disease, and showed an overall response rate of 28%. The hope is this data is actually good enough with a good enough response that it may actually um, uh, allow the FDA to um, allow us to move forward with accelerated approval. Now, there is a phase three trial of melflufen versus POMDEX in relapse refractory myeloma, 
and that ho hopefully will be potentially a registration trial. And in the, in the last couple minutes, I want to talk about now our BCMA-directed therapy. And that's what we, you know, that's what a lot of people said that they would go for in this, in this, pa in this patient that we discussed. So the first one is Belantamab mafidotin, other, now the easy name, Belamaf. A lot easier to say, Belamaf. It's an antibody drug conjugate. The um, conjugated drug is the microtubule dis uh, disrupt disrupting agent, MMF, so MMAF. Um, and this works by ADCC, by traditional antibody drug conjugate toxicity with release of the toxin. It also blocks BCMA and may provide a, a cell death signal that way. In some yet to be described immunogenic cell death, which, which I find very interesting. So it, the DREAM1 study was the phase one study, and we heard about it from, um, from Dr. Cohen and, and then subsequently in Dr. Trudell. And they had an expansion phase where they treated 35 patients. And this drug, the, the kind of the unique thing about this drug is there, there are some adverse events that we don't see with a lot of other myeloma drugs. The most substantial is corneal events happening in about 70% of patients. And thrombocytopenia, about 60% of patients. This is, this is classic for the toxin MMAF. And it's been seen in other antibody drug conjugates in different indications with MMAF. And so you can bet that GSK is working hard to try to limit this toxicity and also to provide recommendations for us when we are able to use this. Um, there also is infusion re reactions, but they did not use any steroids as pre-medications. Now here's the response rate. You can see that the responses were deep. The majority of patients received VGPR, CR, or stringent CR, with an overall response rate in 35 patients from single agent Belomaf of 60%. There's almost no other agent that has had a response rate of 60% in this population. I'll also say that in the DARA refractory, the response rate was, or the DARA exposed, the response rate was also quite good, 38%. And if you look at PFS, the PFS was actually quite good in the study, 12 months, and a duration of a response of about 14 months. So now they've done a very large phase two trial. We were hoping it was going to be a late breaker at ASH. It's not. But I think you'll hear about it very soon, and that also is a potential to lead to early registration. And there's a number of studies planned, including DREAM2 to DREAM10. Um, as you can imagine, they're going to blanket all the drugs in myeloma and see where it's best combined. Okay. Now, what about, what about the bispecific, the BCMA targeted bispecific? And this is the Amgen, the true bite from Amgen, which targets BCMA and CD3. And this data initially, um, uh, cracked Twitter, where everything is first exposed these days, um, in September of last year. And I was sitting next to Keith Stewart, and we looked at each other like, this can't be true. This can't be the, true that this single agent can do this. Well, let's look at it. We looked at 10 patients that were treated at the, what we consider the maximum toler tolerated dose. This is a continuous infusion, four weeks in a row, two weeks off, at 400 micrograms per, per day. And in a heavily uh, refractory population, heavily pretreated, the overall response rate was 70%, with five patients achieving an MRD negative response. Again, single agent IV therapy. That is pretty amazing. Now, it was continuous infusion, and despite this unbelievable response rate, Amgen has decided that they're not going to go forward with the development of this molecule because of the, um, the lack of ease of administration. And in fact, what they have a new technology where they bind the bice with the bite to this half-life extending molecule and hoping that this actually could be administered on a weekly basis and see the same response rate that they've seen in, in um, the earlier studies with 420. Now, they're not throwing it out. It's still in the closet. So if this doesn't work, I think it's going to come out of the closet. But if, it, if, it, but if this does work, then maybe they'll give it to all of us so we can have it in our clinics. Uh, now, my favorite abstract at ASH is actually this one from Celgene. And this is also another BCMA um, uh, uh, bispecific drug. And it basically has, um, it's a standard antibody with an FC component, so it has a long half-life that can be given once a week. Um, but it has uh, two binding domains to BCMA on one arm and a binding domain to CD3 on the other arm. And in this, what they described in their abstract, what I, I'll tell you, get there early for this session, um, in the phase one, first in man study, 
Um, these patients had six prior regimens. They had a number of prior, the usual prior um, medications for myeloma, and they are refractory to their last line of therapy. So in 12 patients treated at greater than or equal to six milligrams um, weekly dosing, the overall response rate was 83%. Stringent CRs of 33%. And if you look at bone marrow uh, MRD negativity, nine of 12. So what we, were, we thought maybe the Amgen one, maybe that's just, you know, it was lucky, it just happened. It's not. This is unbelievable. And there's about eight or nine companies now that have jumped in the BCMA space with a bi-specific drug. So this is going to get really, um, uh, really interesting over the next few years. All right. And with the last minute, what about CARs? Um, and so obviously, a few years ago, we said car is it going to be a game changer? I do think it's a game changer. It is going to ch change the way we practice myeloma. Where it's actually going to fit in the paradigm of myeloma, that we're going to have to figure out over the next few years. But I'm going to show you some, some data. Um, the cars actually differ basically on what they ta uh, target on their cell surface, uh, the type of gene transfer that's utilized, uh, and also uh, the signal signaling domain, whether it's 41BB plus CD3 Zeta or CD28. Um, now, the initial U.S. study showed a pretty good response rate, 60 to 90 percent, um, in really refractory patients. These studies all had seven prior lines of therapy, high risk cytogenetics in the majority majority of patients, with reasonable toxicity rates. CRS mostly grade one and two of 70 to 90 percent, and in less neurotoxicity. Again, mostly grade one and grade two neurotoxicity. But but the problem with CARS has been the persistence of CARS. Right? They haven't been persisting. Now, what about the, the leading compound is obviously is BB2121, now known as Idacel. And this is data that Dr. Rajay has, uh, uh, has presented multiple meetings, but also has published in the New England Journal, again, showing at the, at the higher cell numbers, greater than 150 million, an overall response rate of greater than 95%. And it didn't matter if it was BCMA high or low, everybody responded. And if we looked at PFS, the PFS was 11.8 months. But this disappointed all of us, right? Because it's not like lymphoma or leukemia. There's no flattening of the curve. And so there's still work to do. Now, this is the legend a study that was initially done in China. Again, in a less probably heavily pretreated population. The overall response rate, again, 90%, majority of them being CRs and VGPRs. In a PFS of about 15 months, and despite that it was less heavily pretreated, we're still seeing relapses. That again, that, con that concerns us that maybe this is not going to be a curative therapy in myeloma like lymphoma. Now, so how are we going to improve the car? Well, we can improve it in, in, in many ways, but I'll just say three things. One is we potentially have to improve the binding domain. We may need bisystronic binding domain so that when, it, when a person relapses, it's not because they lost the target or the antigen on the cell surface. We need to enhance the safety, right? Hopefully we can decrease the CRS neurotoxicity and, and have a safety switch or a death signal in the, in, the, in the car so we can turn them off if need be. And then we have to enhance the T-cell efficacy, either by bringing it earlier frontline or being able to manufacture more enriched cells for na naive uh, uh, T-cells. So my second favorite abstract is actually going to be presented by Dr. Cohen. Uh, from Seattle and, and with uh, Dr. Green. Um, and this was a car, their car up in Seattle, which is a, um, this is a first in man study. It's a fully human anti-BCMA car. And what they do is they pre-therapy um, pre with car, give patients a gamma secretase inhibitor and in hoping that the gamma secretase inhibitor can increase the expression of BCMA and make it a be better target. Um, and they're gonna show you data before gamma secretase, after gamma secretase, and then they're gonna show the data after they get the car. And on this, and in the abstract, I'll tell you, they have showed that the overall response rate for their car, and it's a small number of patients, six, was 100%, but two of these patients had had prior BCMA therapy. One happens to be my patient, and completely didn't respond to their BCMA-targeted car at UCSF, and the other one is a patient that received a bite. So this really excites me also, that we might be able to help by giving patients gamma secretation inhibitor, upregulating BCMA, and making it a better target. Next generation, 
Hopefully we're gonna have some off the shelf cars, some allogeneic cars, many good advantages to that. It's taken, the cells are taken from healthy people. One donation maybe can make 20 or 50 cars, right? Not one for one, but one for many. Um, and this is gonna be an on, uh, ongoing uh, study from uh, Selectus and, and it's gonna be led by MD Anderson. Okay, so in, in conclusion, for me, the triple class of refractory patients, it's an unmet medical need. Um, we need, you know, we need more options. Our standard options are limited, but we're gonna get some new options really in the next year. We're gonna have three or four more on our list to, to play around with. We have Selenex or we have alkylator-based therapy, um, and we again have these clinical trials that have shown significant uh, activity. And with that, I'll close. Thank you very much for your attention. Click forward. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to go back to the to the case. I'll remind you of the case. This is a, a patient that had um, a 1Q21 gain in a 414 translocation, and then has had a number of therapies, including RVD, stem cell transplant, and relapse. Um, so the first one is, oh, let's vote. First question is, I think we have two or three questions. Maybe we're only doing the first two. So. This is a person that, that um, relapses and um, is asymptomatic in the relapse. Um, sorry, he relapses with light chains only that are rising. What do we do when light chains are only rising in a high-risk patient? Do we treat him or we don't treat him? Completely asymptomatic. Do we observe? Watch pace of disease. Do we give him a DARA-based regimen, as you can see? Do we give him carfilzomib? Do we give him carfilzomib palm dex? Do we give them the uh, exazomib Lendex, or unsure? Go ahead and vote. I know, I did, I did change it. Yeah, you get to change it. Okay, here we go, perfect. So we got a lot of dare palm dexes. All right, very good. Very easy regimen to go, a very effective regimen, and you know, was selected by us. Okay, so it looks like Darapalm Dex won out on that combination. Okay, I think we have one more question. So the patient was treated with Darapalm Dex, and after two cycles of cheese of VGPR, he continued DPD. We had to change the dosing of Palm and Dex. I personally take Dex off very quickly because I think the antibody plus imid is enough. And then at nine months, he has um, a, sm a small increase in his light chains but he has femur pain and has a new lesion in his femur with a soft, soft tissue component. All right, so what are we gonna do with that patient? Let's, let's vote. Are we gonna radiate the femur and continue DPD? Are we gonna go to Carpomdex, Daracarfilzomib Dex, Elopomdex, Selenexordex, or clinical trial targeting BCMA? I'm curious to see what you guys say. I might change my, my vote too. Okay, so yep, so everybody's going to BCMA targeted therapy, which I think is very appropriate in this patient for, for, for sure. Very good, so clinical trial targeting BCMA, and I think that's, I think that's it with our questions. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Tom. So th thanks to Tom and uh, Vincent for guiding us through a, a lot of very complicated options that we have right now, but uh, some fairly uh, simple answers. Yes. So, uh, any comments uh, from the panel, uh, or how about questions? So we have a question right here. After we do this, we'll be doing the algorithms. Okay. Um, I'm interested in your approach in first line, uh, first relapse treatment after a patient had daratumumab in first line treatment. How would you, would you continue? Would you recombine with other agents, or would you um, switch? So, good, good question. If uh, if Dara is moving up front, uh, how does that uh, change your choices moving forward? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know that's that's where the problem is because we we have very few trials in the first relapse setting, targeting patients who have started on DARA or Lendex as their initial, or even worse, DARA bortezomib Lendex, a DARA VRD regimen, and so it's hard. And that's why I basically said, you know, just go with the principles, two new drugs, 
at least. And thank, you know, unfortunately, the dexamethasone stays, so you, you have to come up with something. So they're on DERA Lendex for their initial. They could go to Carpomdex as their first relapse option, and so on. I mean, it's very difficult. Otherwise, you know, you're just going to be guessing. So you have to look at what the patient had before, and if they are continuously being getting DARA Lendex for four years, like in the Maya trial, you'll have to change fully. I wish Janssen will do a trial where if somebody is on DARA Lendex, then they randomize to KPD versus DARA KPD to show that keeping the DARA going has some benefit, because that's another 100,000 per year. If I'm going to do that, I need to show that extra value is there. I wish they will do that. I don't want it to be like rituximab, where we just keep DARA, DARA, DARA for five years, 10 years. So, so I have a question. If, if we're going to be moving to a DARA four drug regimen, DARA, VRD, and the like, and, and those patients are relapsing, do you see the bites of the CAR-T moving up yes. earlier? Yes, they will. So, Tom, you want to comment on that? Sure. So, you know, at the current time, in some of the data that you've seen, and again, Peter Voorhees will present the Griffin uh, data later, later this weekend, um, that the, these patients are likely going to have a PFS in the 60, maybe 70 plus month range. Okay, so we're making a decision today what we're going to do. We're putting them on DARA RVD. I'm going to tell you five years from now, we are going to have bites approved. We are going to have a couple cars that are approved. And it's probably the next thing is going to be potentially a bite or a car and all the rest of the stuff is going to be, is going to kind of be moot. Now I will tell you that with, with, with the, so there's two things about that. One, when you get a car and you get a bite and you have a response, patients rapidly have undetectable light chains. There is no therapy that we've ever had, stem cell transplant, high dose melphalan, double transplant, that has ever gotten rid of light chains. These drugs are getting rid of so many plasma cells, almost all plasma cells, because the light chains are undetectable. That's a big deal. So they are certainly more potent. They debulk the disease better than anything in my mind. The hard part, like in, in, in Saji and I have been talking about this slide, is infection. Uh -huh. What's it gonna be like, infection? And that's what we're gonna find out over time, is can we do, do that? I do think that with the bites and the cars, we're gonna be able to shorten therapy. So, so right. I, one, I, I have a comment to make. We have a lot of people who want to ask a question. So okay, I'm gonna excellent. So, this all right, go ahead, please. She's telling me to shut up. We, have, we have time. Like to, <laughs> I'd like, just like to continue with this idea of Dara continuous treatment. I, I think the community needs to push Janssen hard to have these trials done because when we think about the many modes of actions that CD38 anti CD antibodies have, it's difficult to imagine that patients can become totally refractory to, to a CD38 antibody. I think it will add something to any combination it's, it's given with. One thing I was missing in the very extensive uh, discussion of drugs to use in the advanced disease is daily oral cyclophosphamide, uh -huh. which can be very e e efficient, especially with daratumumab. I think it, it can do a lot of good things. Yeah, especially with yeah, so, so certainly a very simple option that can sometimes add. Yes, absolutely. Okay, here's my next one. Just two uh, conditions which are difficult. I want to uh, know the opinion of the panel. Seen as myeloma and multiple extramedullary disease. So CNS is really, a, that's a tough nut to crack. So you have, you know, pomalidomide or the image cross the blood-brain barrier, selenexer crosses the blood-brain barrier. Uh, Moravivir, if we ever get it a, a approved, crosses the blood-brain barrier. And, I, and you might get a little cross with, with, with Daratumab, with the antibody. Um, if they have CNS disease, I usually try to give them everything I can. Mm -hmm. Okay, so other questions? Okay, number yes. six. Yes, Number six looks like. Okay, go ahead. I just want to have your brief comments on Rick Aller considering the auto tandem and early relapse setting in the era of expanded armamentarium, especially if you have any other, then it should be an option in the context of a clinical trial. Should we just ignore it as an option or not? What's your word? What? Hmm? Allo. 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 Allo? Yeah. 
Well, so you're going to get a little bit of um, different opinion on that one. So, so for a lot of our, a lot of our centers, allogeneic transplant sometimes excludes people from the clinical trial. So we don't do allogeneic transplant unless they have significant cytopenias and no stem cells stored. Then we do the allo just to get a marrow recovery and hope that we can get a trial that'll open up and give them a chance. No, you know, those patients that are treated like that, none of them are cured by allogeneic transplant. So I, we tend not to do it. Right. So in Europe, what do you think? Well, in, in France, we are not doing allo anymore. Uh, I think that we have plenty of options. We have a lot of studies showing that despite allo patients are progressing, and on top of this, you're inducing uh, toxicity with chronic GVHD. So that's not an option anymore in the French guidelines, at least. Right. Okay. Can I, can I also comment, Brian? Uh, I wouldn't completely close the door on allogenic transplant. There are still some patients who have done extraordinarily well where we had basically given up hope that they would ever have any, kind, any chance of long-term survival. So young patients who have basically exhausted options, who are still in good performance status, um, who are willing to accept uh, an outside chance at long-term survival in exchange for an unproven therapy with long, lots of side effects, we have done it. And there are still some patients who are like that, which as of even this year, we have recommended it. And I know that there are patients who have been multiply refractory, uh, and then 10 years later, they're, they're running marathons and doing well, and, and all of them are allo survivors. Okay, important points. Okay, uh, other uh, questions? Any other questions? Meaning alive? No. No? There's one over oh. there. Is it one question? Right. No? Oh. If not, it's, it's all right. Hey, this is a Chris Crute. Quick question. What would your um, maintenance therapy be for 17P, young? What is the therapy for 17, 17 people? For re relapse? No, just for newly diagnosed, I think. Just up front, I'm just curious. So we would use a bortezomib-based regimen or a proteasome inhibitor-based regimen um, if they got another proteasome inhibitor instead of bortezomib up front. But a PI-based regimen, if, whether it's PI plus LEN or PI alone, um, is certainly my preference. And that's based on the HOAN trial showing for particularly for the 17P patients, an eight-year survival of 50%, exactly the same as a non-17P patient. Right. In, in Dr. Okay. Jakubowiak's data with KRD, it included a small number of patients that also had 17P, and they actually did, did well on that study. So you know, based on belief, some of us will go with KRD as induction therapy for them. So how long would you right. continue DEX um, for the maintenance, or would you just what would your thoughts on that? So the dexamethasone maintenance question, I think in terms of randomized trial, there's one from Italy, Italy. Yep. Mm -hmm. which looked at after the finite duration of induction, LEN versus LEN dex, and they found no benefit to the dex. So even for VRD patients after one year, we are now recommending only LEN maintenance, not LEN dex. Mm 